No, 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 it's much too hot to go digging in a kilt out there in this kind of heat. It's even too hot for my young friend here. Tell you what, send down, um, send that Dr. Jones down there. He likes digging round in the sand. Yeah, use him. He's brought nothing else to this excavation. Get him busy. Hey, folks, how are you all? It's very hot in here. And uh, I've been digging around in this little dusty site in old ancient Egypt. And I've unearthed something rather special. Oh, yes. But I'm not going out there out in the, the heat of the desert right now, getting scarabs up me kilt. Not a good idea. But yeah, feast your eyes upon this. We're going back to 1932. And director Carl Freund's excellent, dreamy, hypnotic masterpiece for Universal Horror Pictures. The Mummy, with Boris Karloff playing The Mummy. And of course, the very famous scene is that during the opening, we've got to the, the dig, the excavation, and Brownwell Fletcher, playing Ralph, has been left to look at the air, uh, the scroll of Thoth. Isn't it weird? Boris Karloff is going to play the reincarnation, well, the revived mummy of uh, Imhotep, and he's got a lisp in real life, and he's got to use the scroll of Thoth. <laughs> Only he could properly say that. He probably couldn't say scroll, scroll. But in that fabulous opening sequence, Carl Freund, who was a German um, cine cinematographer who was brought over by Universal Studios to work in America, was a, you know, an established technician behind the camera. He was also you know, a huge mover and shaker when he started to bring sound in as well. And because he's the first guy to put sound on magnetic tape and also the guy to bring in colour as well. So what a hell of an innovator. But his directorial debut was The Mummy. And The Mummy, of course, Boris Karloff plays the revived Imhotep, as I say. And once he awakens, he then goes into disguise as Ardeth Bey, a renowned Egyptologist running this museum in Cairo. But he gets the hots for, um, oh, what's her name? Zita Johan. Because the mummy always, always, like Dracula, will see a reincarnation of a former love. So he'll then pledge the rest of his existence to try to bring the two of them together. Sometimes against the woman's will, sometimes not. You know, sometimes they genuinely are a reincarnation of this long-lost love. And it's a very sedate and very quiet and measured movie. But it's very hypnotic, very powerful, very dreamlike. The camera work again, which actually, you know, Carl Freund didn't do, even though he was this established cameraman. Um, but it has these dreamlike sort of tracking shots and very fluid shots. But then these very static moments. There's not a lot of action in the film, but there's a lot more than people give it credit for. You've got the huge elaborate flashback sequence of the actual mummification of Imhotep. And you've got all these slaves getting killed as well and spears through them. These scenes were so good, they were used in almost all the other Universal Mummy movies from that point onwards as flashback scenes. And you only ever see the mummy very briefly in marvellous makeup applied by Jack Pierce. Jack Pierce, the makeup guy who Universal always used, who created you know, the Wolfman, he created so many looks for I Am The Lost Souls. Uh, lots of transformations for Bela Lugosi and Lon Chaney and Glenn Strange. This guy was absolutely amazing. And his work on Boris Karloff for this. Now, of course, Boris Karloff is the perfect man to apply these large-scale makeups to because he's very, very gaunt. Like Peter Cushing in later years. Very, very gaunt, very sunken cheeks. You know, very emaciated. And as any makeup effects guy will tell you, that... If you've got a, a bit of a chubster and you're applying makeup to him, like say you want to gouge cheek, well, if his cheek's out there, like imagine putting the makeup on me, to put a, a fake cheek on with a big gouge in it, the head's going to be like a pumpkin, so you need someone very, very slim, because when they're slim, you can put the makeup on, because you've still got to cut into it without cutting into the real flesh, obviously. And therein lies the essence of the magic between Jack Pierce and Boris Karloff obviously for creating Frankenstein's monster as well. And Karloff has these fabulous eyes, 
they made Frankenstein's monster so soulful and enigmatic and pitiable and yet frightening at the same time. And for the mummy, in both the early sequence, which I'm going to chronicle here, and when he plays Ardeth Bay, who's very desiccated and has, you know, he's got his little fez on, but ostensibly he's a, a normal human. He's not like three and a half thousand years old, which he really is. But the skin is like parchment. It's just completely, you know, emaciated. But back in the mummy, when he's actually wrapped up, the bandages look amazing. The, uh, the way they've been applied and they stop around the neck. And, uh, and it, but his flesh is all withered, sunken, decayed. But when foolish Ralph reads aloud from the air, uh, the scroll of Thoth, you know, which obviously reawakens the mummy. One eye slowly opens and a little key light is shone in that eye. So it literally shines. And then of course, in the famous sequence, you don't see the mummy move. You only see the eye open and his hands are like that. And he's got his scarab beetle ring on. And then the hand begins to suddenly move. But what you will see is the hand come in from out of shot to remove the scroll as Bramwell Fletcher is reading somewhat, something else and distracted and then turns around and has one of the best reactions ever in early cinema, early horror cinema. It literally, in a film that's pretty much quite quiet, murders do take place, suspense is there and, and a, a strong eroticism as well, which is what, you know, kind of makes it a little bit, ooh, it is a little bit taboo as well. Um, this lust from beyond the grave. But it's his reaction in these opening moments which sells the movie completely and test audiences and you know anyone who saw that film at that time was forever absolutely having nightmares about it. His reaction, he, he goes into hysterics and then his, his maniacal laughter, he is, his, his mind has completely snapped and it's so, so convincing the way he does it, it's out of this world. But of course, on the initial screenplay, Carl Lemley Jr., who was head of Universal Studios at the time, came to a, a bit of a clash with Carl Freund, the director, uh, because he wanted to harken back to the initial reveal of Frankenstein's monster from James Whale's Frankenstein, uh, which was the year uh, before, 1931, where it was like a succession of close-ups getting really in tight to Boris Karloff's cadaverish face. And he said, that's how we show the mummy coming to life. But Carl Freund, and apparently they almost came to blows over this. Carl Freund said, no, 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 no. Let's not show him moving at all. We'll just show the eye opening, the hand moving, and then the hand coming into frame and taking the scroll. And that's it. That's all we need. And then a little bit of a trail of bandage going out the door. And that's perfect. You know, the audience imagination will do the rest and it's going to completely sell it, which of course it did. But this was a very confusing time for um, Universal. They'd had a huge run of success with the likes of Dracula and Frankenstein. and uh, But they were kind of, is horror the right thing for us? So they began to change what their style was going to be. Or oh, we maybe should stray away from uh, the graphic, you know, visual horror and go into more sort of weird mysteries. So the script for The Mummy changed so much over you know the months preceding its going into production and initially there was a, a script called Cagliostro King of the Undead where the mummy was going to be revived and then in later centuries was going to become quite a renowned uh, necromancer and sorcerer called Cagliostro and they were going to base the real life Cagliostro upon you know the mummy having inhabited this soul and uh, but there was too much sort of sci-fi elements because he was keeping himself alive with like this sort of these weird drugs and chemicals. So Carl he said, no, 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 no. Let's let's go back to ancient Egypt and the mummy and the curse of the pharaohs. Because what had just happened only a few years before? Yes, Carter unearthed the tomb of King Tutankhamun. And the curse of Tutankhamun was then in full effect. And public attention was totally besotted with this. So who did he turn to to write the final script for The Mummy? John L. Balderston. And John L. Balderston had worked on Frankenstein and Dracula as well, and he would do many more movies for the Universal Horror Cycle. 
he had adapted his own stage play of Dracula for the screen. He worked on the story idea for Frankenstein and then later Bride of Frankenstein. So this guy was, you think, perfect. He's more perfect than you can actually imagine because he was there, he was a journalist at the time when Carter unearthed Tutankhamun's tomb. He was actually there at the unveiling of all this. So if anyone had any kind of you know, spiritual affiliation with what this story was going to be, he was the man. And yet even his version underwent several uh, reincarnations. Reincarnations, you see what I'm doing here, you know? So, but the finished movie, where he falls in love with Zita Johan as Helen, and she is so unbelievably sultry and attractive. When he finally does convince her using his mesmerizing eyes, and he will show her visions from the past of who she really is, and he'll try to, you know, reenact the ritual to bring the two of them together. She's wearing the skimpiest of attire. She looks very, very sexy and very alluring. And this is 1932, gotta remember that. Anyway, folks, the film is a masterpiece and I've always loved it. And I find in the last sort of, you know, decade or so, I've encountered many people in real life and virtually, you know, in the forums, particularly women who love the mummy because of this dreamlike romantic angle to it. Anne Rice interviewed the vampire, even wrote her version of the mummy. And that was a real big romantic overblown friggin' mess. <laughs> I didn't like it at all. But uh, but women do seem to be very sort of smitten with this story. And it's it's heartwarming that the, the film still lives on. And people that you wouldn't expect, you know. Teenage goth girls with piercings and tattoos with the wazoo and back. But they're smitten with the mummy and not Brendan Fraser. No, it's Boris Karloff and all that. So let's drink to that. But, folks, as the title suggests, I've got something to show you here. From Universal Studios Diamond Select range. Look at this. There is an exact reproduction of the sarcophagus that houses Imhotep during that opening sequence. There it is, look at the detail on that, look at the colours. In reality, the sarcoph sarcophagus or sarcophagi would be really vivid and garish in, in colours. And obviously with this, you can tell that what they've done, they've weathered and aged it, so the colours, which were bright and vibrant, have obviously you know been dulled over the passage of time, but look, Look at all the emblems and you know the, the writings, the hieroglyphics, the design work. Look at the detail on this. Look at it. And it tell you what, it weighs a fair bit. Look at the face. You know. And the base. The face and the base. Look at the base. There's lots of weathering and cracks and all sorts of age and wear and tear on it. And the colouring, you know, the stone is immaculate. But it's what's inside though, folks. Let's get this right. We've unearthed it. Now we're going to open it. Oh, that age old air and gas will come out. And who do we find inside? Da, 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 da. It's Imhotep himself, Boris Karloff. Now, folks, I don't know who sculpted this. I really don't. And I've, the packaging is there, and I've looked all over it, and I can't find it. So I'll tell you what, I'd be crap on excavations. Because it's probably in big letters there, and I've just gone, oh, no, it's not in there. Can't find it. But the figure comes out, and we genuinely have a wonderful recreation of Boris Karloff in Jack P. Pierce's makeup as in Motef the Mummy. Perfect in every way. The hands are crisscrossed the right way. If you can see there, then if you can see the scarab beetle ring is on his finger there. The bandaging does stop around the neck and the face is that emaciated face. The eyes are shut. The hair was, was waxed back. Lots of paper and tissue and other materials were adhered to Boris Karloff's face. The bandaging was pretty much bandaging wrapped around him and then aged and worn and torn and stuck down and then ripped and then pulled away and stuck down again. P 
painstaking process for only what is literally a few a few seconds of footage. You see him in there. You see him in the background as well. I mean, it's it is spectacularly eerie, and it's funny how like he spends the rest of the movie as a normal, well, normal-ish human being. He's not wrapped in bandages, put it that way, but he is very emaciated, and his skin is so granular, you know. But in pretty much every subsequent Mummy movie that Universal and then Hammer would make, you know, he would be swathed in bandages, and everyone says like all the Mummy films, they just they was just pretty much the same every time. But I have a thing about the movie. I, I do like it because this version is spectacular because it's, it's got emotion and he is a real, genuine person. He isn't just a lumbering brute. But the subsequent films would always be... I mean, he may, have a, he may fall in love with some woman. He always did that. Uh, or he may find a long-lost love. But he would be reincarnated because his tomb has been desecrated. But there'd be a human villain who would use him, awaken him, and use him to do their bidding. So out would go the mummy, frequently crashing through someone's French windows, and then usually, because he only had one good hand, the, rep, the other arm was either bandaged up or it was just useless, and he'd, a one-handed stranglehold, and he'd force them over the desk, crunch the neck in. Or in Hammer's version, Christopher Lee playing Carice, not Imhotep, Carice, he would break the backs of these people. Oh, God. But he'd, he'd be slow, he'd be lumbering. And people say, like, well, that's not terrifying because you can easily outrun him. Well, maybe you can, but the thing is, he's not going to stop. He's like Michael Myers or Jason Voorhees. And although they may just strike at random, he's been given a task to get you. So he's not going to stop. And you can be shotgunned, pitchfork, set on fire. You know what? He's still going to come back. Brilliant. I, I'm, that's why I like him, because there's something relentless about his slow rampage that if he's after you shit you know you can run but you can't hide but there he is this is a wonderful sculpt wonderful there's no articulation in it whatsoever but it doesn't need to be you know i think there is another version of this where he's in a kind of like pose well maybe not snarling and growling but his hands are outstretched uh, there may be some articulation with that, but this is the one that I like the most because that's how you see him in the movie. Trick or Treat Studios are about to release. This is October. No, it's not. It's August right now, 2020. But in September 2020 comes out The Mask from Trick or Treat Studios of um, Imhotep with the desiccated flesh from inside the sarcophagus. And also one of... Um, Ardith Bay with his fez on as well. <laughs> I will be getting them. They're bringing out a whole range of universal masks and hammer masks as well. But look at that. So you see him standing in the background and while well, Bramwell Fletcher is foolishly reading aloud and that stands next to him. So that's how you can recreate it there. And there's some weight to this, folks. I kid you not. This weighs a fair bit. You know, if I was into like um, snatch and grab in a jeweler's window, that'd be, I wouldn't need a brick. Use that. Boosh! That whole thing is going to go through. Bulletproof glass, you could hail that. That's, that's going to be a thing of the past. Hmm. Let's show you the packaging. Yeah, it's very big, very elaborate. Nice design there, as Boris Karloff looks in the movie. The Mummy, Universal Studios, House of the Original Monsters. <laughs> nice little, um, you know, blister pack, is that the phrase? Packaging, you know, it's very nice and secure in there, should you be about to go and order one yourself. On the back, that's what you're getting, obviously. And there's the things that they also did. I, mean, I think there's more in the range now. Um, Christian Bat Lagoon, that, that'd be awesome, that. But I like this. Look at the, the, the little fun set here of the Wolfman. Because you all know that's my favourite character. And there's my wolf headed cane from the Lon Chaney, the Wolfman. Work of art. Thanks to Steve 007 Smith for that. Forever in your debt, mate. But yeah. 
as a piece of you know cult genre furniture in your house that's ideal it's gorgeous it's heavy it's got so much weight depth and solidity to it that it's a valid piece of you know literally artwork sculpture put it on your shelf put it like that open it up you know lay it flat do whatever you want with it you know but it is an absolute genuine work of art i'm really really impressed with it and there's a german release of that as well um but from what i can tell there's no difference it's just it's for sale for German people. Anyway, I've got to get back to him um, looking at this scroll here. So I've got I've got the scroll, you know. We found it a bit earlier. So let's just see what it says here. This is the scroll of Thoth. Thoth, Thoth, Thoth. Thoth by the way, was um, an Egyptian god. It's often referred to as a scroll of life or death, you know in a lot of these movies and you read from this and you're going to awaken the mummy well only a fool would do something like that what does it say anyway Glatu Barada Nikto hmm doesn't sound very um, ancient Egyptian to me Glatu Barada Nikto That does sound, sound familiar. Where did it come from? Maybe I should ask my mummy. Maybe she knows. Kartu Barada Nikto. Ah! <laughs> 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 little walk <laughs> you, you, you should have seen its face it looked just like my wife hey folks Killman at your service please take it easy be happy be healthy take it easy out there because you know there's a sandstorm on the horizon you just can't trust those Egyptians can you <gasps> he went there Folks, keep it Celtic, keep it Celtic, and uh, I'm going to see you all <laughs> There was a famous Liverpool band, um, kind of influenced by e Egypt, Egyptian music, couldn't say that then, they were called the Scarab Beatles. Ah!